Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us this Friday, January 12th, to stay curious. Today, we're going to talk about two shuttle missions that were about 11 years apart. Uh, the one is the last successful shuttle mission before the Challenger tragedy, and the other one exchanged a, a pretty cool astronaut that spent over 150 days on the Internet, uh, not the International Space Station, on the Mir Space Station. And that's why Selvin, my board man here today, chose this picture of the Mir. Uh, that is an awesome picture there off my shoulder here is the two spacecraft docked to it. This is taken by a either a space shuttle either leaving it or about to, to go to it there, which we had think eight dockings, nine visits of it, exchanged seven astronauts, quite a program in the 1990, late 90s. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. And we're also going to take you to a spaceport uh, that uh, I'll bet you've never heard about, the Lake County Spaceport in Illinois. A spaceport in Illinois? Yeah, there's one there. And Steve Jokums is the director of it there. And we're going to talk a little bit about that at the end and, and uh, in a way of thanking Steve and his business for supporting the in our whole museum as well as Stay Curious from the Lake County Spaceport. That's their official emblem there. So stay curious about that as we go through today's program. And we are very grateful that everybody spends their time, those of you regulars, uh, to uh, hear us give our little programs about particularly today, the shuttles of the month. And today we're talking about the shuttles of January. Ten beautiful shuttles launched in January, 54 astronauts. All five shuttles were launched in, in the month of January. Of course, Challenger unsuccessfully. Uh, we've got two missions to the Mir t uh, space station on this one. Uh, 81 that we're going to talk about today. And 89 we'll talk about later in the month. These are in order of when they were launched, okay, not numerical order or anything like that. We've talked about the LDEF retrieval, the Long Duration Exposure Facility on 32 in 1990 and the 1996 mission that our astronaut friend Winston Scott did one of the coldest spacewalks ever on purpose to test uh, equipment uh, with Leroy Chow. On another spacewalker on STS-72 testing equipment that was eventually used on the International Space Station to build it. So today, two shuttles launched on January 12th, one in 86, one in 97. And let's just jump into those. Uh, and we're going to, I just want to tell you, we got some cool news uh, coming up. Some satellite photos that will blow your mind of the Japanese earthquake that happened 12 days ago. Well, here is a... Uh, uh, probably a Mark Usiak photograph on the tarmac there as Hoot Gibson is addressing the press on STS-63. Uh, 63C uh, was launched on January 12th, 1986 and um, has some pretty interesting people on there. Two Nelsons, all right. And two future NASA administrators are in this group there. Can you spot them? And a uh, very seasoned astronomer, spaceman, is on this mission there. And then uh, we've got a guy that we've met several times at the Space Center, Bob Senker. So who are these people? Let me see. i got another picture of them here. We'll show you. That is Bill Nelson, our current administrator on the left. Uh, and uh, this was his flight. And in 1986, the space transportation system was deemed such a safe space truck for commercial satellite commerce that Florida Congressman Bill Nelson, now the current NASA administrator, rode along as a government observer with six other astronauts. To his credit, Bill Nelson considers himself a space uh, traveler tourist, a space uh, participant is how he likes putting it. Uh, so uh, didn't get astronaut wings because he wasn't in one of the classes. <clears throat> but um, And he's been a good leader for NASA here uh, in the um, Biden administration. Well, uh, this, all right, and who else is there? Well, there's Bob Sinker, and that's Bob's first and only flight. 
and Bob is the t uh, speaker out at the Space Center the next couple days. We met him a few times. He does a great talk about the science experiment he took up there. Uh, but that was his one and done. Uh, we've got next to him, uh, oh, that's uh, Steve Hawley, his second of five flights. He helped deploy this, this, this uh, Hubble telescope. You have beside him, making his first of seven flights, is Franklin Chang Diaz. Uh, and he's active in a company that he's president of. Uh, there next to Diaz, you've got uh, Charlie Bolden, the first of four flights. He was twice a pilot, twice a commander, and uh, is, was NASA administrator in the Obama administration for eight years. So back to back, we've had, well, not back to back, because we had a different administrator uh, and the other president. But uh, then we got at the end there, George Pinky Nelson, his first of three flights, and addressing the the crew, uh, the press there is Hoot Gibson, second of five flights, commander. Uh, so he was a pilot once and now a commander the second time uh, on uh, this this uh, launch uh, with Columbia on 63C. It was much delayed. They had four attempts to launch it. Uh, it was launched at night, the 24 shuttle flight overall deployed satellites, performed experiments, and observed Halley's Comet. Orbiter Columbia had been upgraded 18 months before this flight, so it flew flawlessly uh, on, its, on this flight. Uh, Hoot Gibson would later call this flight the end of innocence for the shuttle program because when it landed after a six-day mission on January 18th, 10 days later was the fatal launch of Challenger. So kind of a looking back at how glib and confident we were. They did not wear space suits. They wore these overhauls just to be all looking alike, basically. And uh, uh, so very, there's their signatures uh, on a uh, item that is sold frequently in our auctions and uh, even on our eBay presence. Uh, we kind of add up $25 in astronaut name and then $100 if you get the whole crew to sign it. So you got two, you got uh, uh, two, four, six, seven. All right, so you got $175. Who's the other one that signed it up there at the top? Uh, oh, that, that is a Nelson up there. So that's worth $250 to $300 all day long in our auction. Uh, signed lithograph with the crew there. When they landed, they had to land at Edwards Air Force Base, all right, because of the weather. They got, uh, I think they stayed up one extra day after deploying their space uh, telescopes, not space satellites. Um, so Nelson, who was the senator for, he was the Florida congressman at the, uh, at the House, he thought he's going to land in Florida, the land of oranges, right? No, they landed in Edwards Air Force Base, and they gave him a crate of California oranges. <laughs> and we have that where he signed it there. So in good nature, he ate one there on the runway while he was convalescing there. So uh, pretty cool mission. There's a, there's a Nelson today as our administrator. Uh, we've got Pam Melroy, an astronaut, the assistant. Uh, there's the future administrator, Bolden, in the uh, commander's seat. <clears throat> and there's Charlie Bolden dressed up for his picture uh, uh, for his Washington tenure there for eight years. So a uh, beautiful night launch taken by the UCAC brothers. Tom, thank you for sharing your pictures. And uh, they got a streak out of it, too, there. <clears throat> Just like we're shooting those streaks all the time of the Falcon 9s going up. Uh, you didn't get to practice that as often, did you, Tommy and Mark Usiak, as you can now around here. Uh, so I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, looking back at that mission. And again, it was the last shuttle mission before Fateful Columbia. Uh, so it had a lot of import to a lot of people. And then another shuttle that was launched on January 12th, this one, 19, um, uh, what's my, uh, 96, is STS-81, which was the uh, fifth 
shuttle docking uh, of uh, with the Mir space station. All right, and my notes on that I'm looking at here in my January. Let me grab that as I go like this to let everybody know our team is wearing the same T-shirt today here. Karen Conklin and uh, was just in here, and we got uh, Anita Truex, our office manager. She's wearing one new. Our new uh, hire, Lillian, she's got one on. And it all started with you, Salvin, running the board today for Marty that, that, that you got uh, these uh, shirts going for us here. So we're looking mighty retro today. And there, that helped me stall enough to get my 81 notes out here. As that's what we are here. We don't pretend we're just the, we're a, a podcast that loves to celebrate space the best we can do it. And we're glad you're all hanging with us. Well, this was the first shuttle flight of 97, marked the return of U.S. astronaut John Blaha to Earth. All right, there's the patch. Our friend, Mike Baker, is the commander. All right, Bakes was the pilot on his first flight of a shuttle with John Blaha as his commander. So we talked about Bakes on a wonderful Stay Curious interview we had about the irony of him going to pick up his commander and here he is the commander of a spaceship. Uh, and uh, so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, Atlantis carried the first plants that completed a life cycle in space, a crop of wheat grown from seed to seed. All right. And uh, this continued our relationship with Russia that continues today, of course. Here's the astronauts of this crew looking casual out on a uh, the test uh, demonstration day, maybe. Left to right, there's John Grunstra, who is really more famous as a Hubble telescope spacewalker. Uh, you've got next to him is uh, Mike Baker, the, the commander. And Bakes, after four missions, spent five years as our liaison in Russia, putting American astronauts on the Russian spaceship. Uh, next to him is his pilot, Brent, Brent Jett. Then you've got uh, speaking there would be Peter Wissoff. And uh, that's, uh, no, that's Jer Jerry Lininger. Yeah, Lininger's talking there. And Wissoff is next to him. Lininger's got the microphone. He's going up to be left on the Mir space station. And when he was up there, a fire happened. And he was lucky to get out of there alive. But uh, they did uh, put that fire out and uh, clean things up. And he did his uh, five months up there. And then uh, Peter Wissoff there is, uh, uh, and I'm trying to, he is married to uh, Camara. Now, who's he married to? Oh, I can see her face. And Marsha Ivins is the woman on there. And this was Marsha's, uh, she went to space four or five times. I'm not sure what sequence this was for her, so I didn't write that down. The STS-81, uh, there's what the Mir space station looked like. Quite a confabulation of modules that were docked and added. And, of course, the important solar panels to give any space station the energy and life that it needs. This was the fifth mission. Again, the fourth astronaut on Mir was replaced by Leninger. Uh, and um, things that were pioneered things on the Mir space station that the Russians and Americans are doing now uh, on our International Space Station. So uh, there they are all on board. The Mir looks pretty clean on there in the Mir there. They always had a section there with the American flag. That was cool to see up there. You see uh, uh, above, I love looking Selvin around the back at the very top. You see Yuri Gagarin's picture up there. You see uh, uh, Tolstovsky, the flight, uh, the guy there, Robert Goddard, up there, and uh, just everything's everywhere up there in weightlessness. Uh, so we've talked a, a lot about the mirror on our program. We'll continue to talk about it. Has this brought back Blaha for, uh, after his uh, 150 days up there? So, and there's the mirror, the picture that we took there. It uh, came back to Earth. Uh, and uh, about 2010, I think, was this demise. I get those dates messed up. And there's Marsha in the mirror. 
there with Leninger and one of the Russian cosmonauts there. Kind of a cool casual picture as they're floating around in space, of course, microgravity doing that to them. So 10 shuttles of January. Uh, we look forward to, uh, uh, I have their patch backwards here. Oh, uh, yeah, I wanted to show the other mirror flight. There, there, there's the other mirror where Terry Wilcutt was the commander of that, and Wilcutt was Mike Baker's co-pilot on another mission there. So there are those astronauts coming out. There's Terry Wilcutt on the right. Terry's uh, been a friend of the museum for a long time. One of the things that they did on that uh, mission was uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek here was a microgravity experiment on the signal transduction pathways in sperm of a sea urchin. So to celebrate that, they came up with this cute little patch of Homer Simpson uh, running around as one of those spermatoid. A sperm shuttle to mirror on the bio rack there. Yes, they have a patch for everything. And that was on STS-81 that we've been talking about with uh, uh, that dropped off Leninger and brought back Blaha. So just one of the fertilization of a sea urchin eggs and sperm motel mobility were negatively impact under low uh, hypergravity forces significant to space flight. So uh, uh, that's not too good for reproduction in space and don't know where that sounds. Well, enough of the space shuttle stuff. What is this that I pulled out of my hat to share with you today? Well, as I cruise around like everybody does, surfing on space news, I ran across this. And this is the Noto Peninsula in Japan uh, before the 7.6 magnitude earthquake struck, struck Japan on January 1st. Now, uh, this was a bad earthquake if you hadn't kept up with it. <clears throat> Sometimes news is, is uh, hard to keep up with or you heard it one time and you don't hear it again. But this is the shoreline of Japan's Noto Peninsula before and after. That earthquake brought up ground to create 80 800 more feet that's two football fields of of shoreline there okay you see the the that breaking that's before right up to the road well you got more beachfront property now you can build there but a lot of stuff was destroyed here's another look at it one of the little lagoons they have there and how the earthquake welled up and created more shoreline there look at that what a difference huh just just brought that up uh, the photo captures the uh, changes and after the tsunami had already subsided, some ports were left completely dry and inaccessible to boats. So imagine being just a recreational fisherman and if you had your boat out the out the no two peninsula dock for 20 years and next thing you know, uh oh, it's it's either gone or or it's in the parking lot and you got to they got to build new docks and everything. So I thought you'd enjoy that. Also, let's keep us up to date on what's going on with the Peregrine spacecraft that's uh, orbiting. Not sure what the orbital project uh, trajectory is, if it's in a locked in a solar orbit now because it didn't make it to the moon. But regardless, um, we do know that soon after launching the first ever United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket this Monday, January 8th, the lander encountered an anomaly due to a stuck valve in its propulsion system, damaging the spacecraft, causing a propellant link, uh, and that no lunar landing will be possible. Well, yesterday, Astrobiotics, uh, that is the builder of this, issued its 12th mission update uh, on the platform X, indicating that despite the crippling propulsion system anomaly, there's some good news. Peregrine was able to power up its payloads, the ones that require power anyway, and establish connections to ground teams using NASA's Deep Space Network of Communication Antennas. That is vital so that they can redo this again. Uh, they want to, Astrobiotics has this as their main lander that they want to take 
uh, ride shares and, and other things on board there. And we'll talk to about here in a minute some of the ride shares on board. Uh, this is part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payloads Service Program. And in February, we're going to have another one launched that we'll talk about in a second. The update from Astrobiotic had these pictures. Well, not that picture. I want more. This was the first picture it released earlier in the week of the side of the Peregrine. Buckled, as you can see, uh, is the, 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 the side of it. You can even see one of the poles there or support struts is damaged. And yes, they had a build, uh, they had this valve stuck open and create an explosion. And there you see the evidence of it from one of the pictures that was going to take a cameras that was going to be uh, recording the landing. Uh, yesterday, they released this photograph, which at first seems a little innocuous, right? What am I looking at? Well, what you're looking at at the bottom are the wheels of the tiny iris lunar rover all right about the size of a little little uh, you know a, a couple feet long like you would use any sort of toy that uh, you'd be uh, uh, using uh, remotely this was built by carnegie mellon university so they're not happy that they're seeing their wheels against the backdrop of outer space and not on the surface of the moon. Nonetheless, they're trying to get as much science as they can. The payload, the rover, this rover has communicated. That's important so that they know that they built it right. Uh, uh, let's see. It was built by Colomena Micro Robots. All right. Uh, there's a radiation detector built by Germany on board. Five scientific instruments designed by NASA, which were supposed to analyze the surface. Uh, Astrobiotics' own optical precision autonomous landing sensor is working, though it's not going to land anywhere. And uh, there's a time capsule on board uh, and a soft drink can containing handwritten messages from people around the world that were laser etched into titanium plates. That I've never heard about. Uh, but apparently that had power to it or something. What's not being talked about are the human remains aboard it. And the human remains uh, are 62 sets of remains, including ashes from sci-fi writer Arthur C. Clarke, and Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry. They're on board this Peregrine lander. Uh, so there's also, that was uh, 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 that was provided by uh, Celestius, and there's also Elysium Space has a payload aboard Peregrine that I'm told by, by reading this has also human remains on it. So. We have human remains floating in outer space, and, and I'm going to find out where that orbit is. Uh, I, it'll be locked in an orbit, maybe a big wide orbit around the Earth. By wide, I mean a million miles out and coming back, so we'll see. Uh, but uh, the, uh, what, what, uh, the launch of the Peregrine kicked off NASA's commercial, like I said, lunar payloads services program. And here's the next lunar service payload that was got some government money to go up. And this is called Nova Sea Lander. And this is built by Intuitive Machines, a company in Houston. It's going to be launched on top of a Falcon 9 rocket with the goal of reaching the moon about a month later. So mid-February is the plan. They were going to do it here uh, next week. But because of the backlog of the uh, being delayed, uh, the couple of the missions ahead of it, uh, they uh, opted out to wait for the next lunar cycle. And so if it's going to land on the moon, they only have a three or four day window to do that so that when it lands, it has the proper lighting and so forth on there. So, uh, But this um, is, is the Nova Sea Lander bought by Houston's Intuitive Machines, and it has different payloads on it, a couple ride shares, 
there this is a photo taken during a uh with some of the uh people that are providing money to it investors capital investors of course it's a big deal for these space companies to get the money they need because it takes a lot of money and the returns of some of the corporate investors is uh, financial and others it's just the pride in doing this so there you get a good idea what this looks like they have another lander beside it there and uh once uh, once they get it on the moon it'll look like that in an artist's conception so i uh, hope they get it on the moon also if you follow our program uh, chris stott uh, with the company lone star out of tampa uh, st pete area has a hard drive that he has on that to store your data on the moon and so we're anxious to hear if Chris's hard drive could be communicated back and forth the quarter million miles between the Earth and the Moon. So, all right. We're glad that you're all hanging in here with us today as this photo of a prototype space station by the, uh, uh, actually, I've got it upside down there. Well, it's not really upside down. There's no right or upside down. The Earth is at the top there. This is a, a concept for the Blue Reef space station by blue origin well nasa awarded 100 million dollars in additional funding to commercial space partners this week that are developing low earth orbit destinations with the iss retiring probably around 2030 the nasa space act agreement with blue origin and voyager space uh, is to develop concepts for a new orbiting laboratory as part of NASA's Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations Program called CLD. And they announced modifications of their, their existing uh, uh, agreements, including new technical milestones, and reallocated $100 million to Blue Origin in Voyager Space specifically to build the replacement private though commercial uh, space stations for the international space station so you got axioms wanting to build a space station they're going to put parts of it onto our international space station then break away over the next three years uh, and other companies are also wanting to put space stations up there Ru china's in the play don't hear much about russia wanting to build a space station uh, but i'm sure they don't want to be left behind so well, that's sort of the spacey news of the day. We want to give you all a shout out that our charity auctions are going to be kicking off this year. Uh, can't see the charity auctions space memorabilia words there. Uh, but the uh, the uh, next auction is um, uh, in our clever little news release that Karen Conklin, our executive director, put together. She says, don't let old FOMO, fear of missing out, get to you, okay? You can join the American Space Museum and bid again auctions. We're having three charity auctions in this quarter. February 3rd on a Saturday will be focused on American astronaut autographs. And then March 9th, it's going to be uh, regular space memorabilia. And then April 13th. Photos, ex exclusively photos, are going to be auctioned off on April 13th. And all these auctions are going to be online. Go to our website to see the link to that. They're going to start at noon Eastern Standard Time. And again, American Space Museum at the top. We've got auctions up there. Also, bid again auctions. Uh, Chuck Jeffrey, the owner of that, and in fact, our chief operating officer of our nonprofit here, as Chuck has, uh, without a doubt, brought in the bulk of the money that has sustained us on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, thank you, Chuck, for doing that. And uh, there's always bid till it hurts, all right, on these auctions. Then bid some more. Well, we've got a special little thing to show you here today of a, of, of, of a new great partner, the American Space Museum, Steve Jokums. Uh, uh, we've heard us talk about uh, Steve J at the uh, Lake County Spaceport. And where is the Lake County Spaceport? Well, it's up there in uh, the northeast corner of Illinois. 
uh, near the shores of, of Lake Michigan, about a two, two and a half hour drive out of Chicago, I understand. And it's kind of a resort area there, beautiful outdoor scenery, of course, with lakes and so forth. Fox Lake, Illinois, is where Steve Jokums bases his Lake County Spaceport. This is his web, his website uh, page there. Um, his uh, motto, Ad Astra Perfumai. And what does that mean? Through hardships to the stars. To the stars, Ad Astra, through hardships. So uh, I think that's also the state motto of Kansas, if I'm not mistaken. But there's uh, his beautiful little logo that they've created uh, to uh, honor the space shuttle, rockets, and so forth. Their 12th anniversary is this year, so we're going to help them along. Uh, Steve established this in 2012 to provide both a display venue for unique and exotic space modeling projects, uh, but also as a point of access for other space modelers to find information that they might find helpful. This is a modeling group, okay? They make beautiful models. Uh, so tongue in cheek, he's cre created a, a space port up there, uh, Steve Jokums has. And uh, Steve has generously given to the American Space Museum like so many of you have. And we appreciate his $500 donation, which represented 10% of his proceeds uh, during a period of time in his business there. So this represented $5,000 of income that Steve took in and, and graciously gave us $500 of that that we're gonna put to good use in some equipment here in our museum uh, studio as we figure out what it is, what direction we're gonna go. And that direction is gonna be figured out when we meet with several professional uh, people that are familiar with uh, uh, doing this. So. Got a question or comment? Uh, got, a com got a comment from Steve G. He says that Ad Astra Performa is to the stars through modeling. Oh, is it through modeling? Okay. okay. Well, you know, I Googled that, Steve, and of course the, the Latin was messed up on the Google. But uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ad Astra uh, astra per aspera is a Latin, Latin phrase meaning through hardships to the stars. I had the wrong quote there. So to the stars through modeling, form, formula. That's what I thought that uh, okay. meant somehow. Yeah. Formia up there. So thank you for co correcting that. And we're going to talk to Steve personally by Google Meets. We hope that he comes to the museum here. He said he'll be here for Shuttle Fest. We'll get you all to meet him. I got a picture of Steve here. Where do I have? There he is right there. There you go, Steve. Jokum's there. He's got him an astronaut blue suit there, of course. He is eat up with it, just like all of us are. We're eat up with it in different levels, aren't we, Steve? But what a modeler this guy is. And we're going to brag about his not only his modeling prowess, but his company that supplies you with the decals and other things that you just can't paint, like instrument panels and, and all that detail. So... Looks like he's got the shuttle in the background there. That's obviously a V2 rocket on the left. Uh, looks like uh, a couple single stick rockets there. Maybe a, a Titan on the right hand there with a couple side pods on it. And, of course, behind him, the mighty uh, Saturn V, which those are decals apparently on there. So a couple models I wanted to brag about that uh, you shared with me, Steve, is uh, this beautiful model of Skylab as we're celebrating the 50th anniversary and there is the Skylab documentary that we're going to be talking to Dwight and Alexandra the directors and producers of that here starting next week and start bragging about the end 50 years ago this program ended with the last crew coming back to earth so uh, get your Skylab stuff ready we're going to be talking about Skylab a lot here on Stay Curious and what a way to kick it off with this beautiful, beautiful model. And uh, again, I believe on the solar panels there, that would be decals. Or certainly he's offering different things like the shield there that looks very accurate. And here's Steve's model of the command module. Look how beautiful that silver looks on there. Uh, and uh, again, decals, 
little miniaturized things that have to go on there. We'll talk to Steve more about it uh, as we go down the line. Uh, and there's a lunar module, of course, our favorite, the Grumman lunar module. And as I look at that, and uh, I'll be showing this to Marty in detail, Steve, is uh, he's got the Kapton foil on there. That's the silver. No, I mean, the Mylar is the gold. And you do have some Kapton foil on there. That's the orange looking, particularly up there at, the, at the, the door up there. You can see the real dark orange on there. And then you got the Kapton foils, the, the gold. And then the dark is the Inconel, like you see underneath the thruster shield there in the middle of the lunar module there. So that looks like a beautiful, beautiful model there. And uh, again, Lake County Spaceport, that's his website. We'll be posting that on Facebook at our social media outlets as we thank Steve Jokums for his generous contribution. But more, more important than that, Steve, you've been a, a, a visible supporter of us along with all of our other friends that regularly spend an hour uh for with me and and to get this kind of information that they can't get anywhere else so one last picture there can't i mean my eye goes to the n1 to the left there selvin you might not know that but that that's the saturn V rocket and the the launch umbilical tower there that's quite complicated to build but he's got over there that is russia's moonship called the uh, uh and the l1 and uh it i think was launched three times maybe four but i know three times for sure once it blew up on the pad killing 200 of their top scientists wow. and then several times it didn't get in the air more than uh 30 seconds when something like well it's it's like elon musk starship it's got like 30 or more engines on the bottom of that so that's a be two beautiful looking models there and we'll be bragging about Steve Jokums, Jokums and his Lake County Spaceport in the future. So thank you all for enjoying today. Stay curious. Hope that you got uh, saw something that you hadn't seen before, like the how the Japanese coastline has been restructured by uh, earthquakes. And of course, that we're on Earth. We have a magna below us that's moving these tectonic plates. A uh, uh, earthquake can happen anywhere around the world, not just those places that are the hot bits. So, Selvin, excellent job. I know those of you are missing Marty Winkle. I miss him too. He's been out two weeks with this horrible respiratory. Uh, not that he is so sick. It's just he is so courteous that he doesn't want to get out and get anybody else sick. So, I miss you, brother Marty, and we'll get you back in here. But, Selvin, you've done a great job. And we appreciate that. Who today do we want to thank for watching today's broadcast? We have Doug Forrest, Dave Stingy, Steve J, Marina Barr, Tom Uziak, and Carlton Bailey. All right. We appreciate you all being regulars. And there's many of you that never chime in. And that's okay because that's the way social media is. But it's important to us that you share with your friends if you like what you see here. And we are going to really go through 2024 and try and buff this program up a little bit. I am completely off uh, script, no script in front of me, except these that I throw down and print out. My main script is our slideshow script here. So maybe one day we'll get a teleprompter and things like that. But uh, we really appreciate it. Can't say enough how we have done more than 670 900, 970 episodes, uh, and it'll be four years in March when we started this thing, born out of the pandemic. So hope everybody enjoys the weekend, whatever you're doing. Hope it's safe and it brings you back here to stay curious and more importantly, our museum sometime down here in sunny Florida. Until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying have a great weekend and I can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.